What is up guys, it is KikiZilla101 here yet again and welcome back to Kiki Quest. We're at the University of Colorado. Um, we're gonna be going to the Museum of Natural History where we'll find the skull of one of the most iconic dinosaurs ever, the three-horned Triceratops. Arriving on campus, we quickly realized just how many brilliant public access museums the university has to offer. But nonetheless, we begin searching for our destination. I'd be lying if I said we didn't get a little confused and a little lost. But eventually we made it, and we were welcomed by a beautifully condensed room of prehistory. The first display I approached was actually quite a pleasant surprise. Immediately upon seeing the skull shape, I recognized it. Rudiodon has a special place in my heart for being one of the animals depicted in my favorite prehistoric documentary, When Dinosaurs Roamed America. I had never seen a fossil of one up until this point, and I was happy to see a plaque confirming its identity. For such a small museum, I was thoroughly impressed with the variety of fossils that were on display here such as small feathered dinosaurs and proto-mammals, very similar to Placerius that appeared in the first episode of the extremely popular Walking with Dinosaurs. Hoplophonius, another animal with abnormally large teeth, although instead of tusks, these animals bared impressive sabered canines. While maintaining a striking resemblance to big cats like the famous Smilodon, Hoplophonius wasn't actually a true cat, but was closely related to their primitive ancestors. And with teeth like these, Hoplophonius was also unmistakably a voracious carnivore. But as we will soon learn, not all animals are as easy to read. Sometimes you have to dig deeper to reveal an animal's true identity. One of my favorite walls in the room was this display of some of the smallest, most delicate, and rare finds of this collection a beautiful gallery of glimpses into the past. We often think of large dinosaurs and other prehistoric megafauna when we try to picture what the world was like eons ago, but I think we often overlook how important these small finds can be. They show us the foundations of these prehistoric ecosystems. After all, there wouldn't be room for massive predators like T-Rex at the top of the food chain if there wasn't anything at the very bottom. Sometimes the biggest surprises come in the smallest packages. While fossils do reveal information of the past, unfortunately they also often bring up more questions than answers. Everyday occurrences sealed in rock, like burrows, copper lights, and trackways, offer a unique chance to observe a much more specific moment in time. However, they still have limitations to how much they can tell us. Who, what, when, where, and why. For example, we are all too often left to wonder who left these tracks? On the other hand, sometimes we do know who left the tracks, and these cases where we have more information can actually cause a whole new problem in itself. In fact, an entire Edmontosaurus skeleton can leave just as many unanswered questions as its tracks. Edmontosaurus was from the Hadrosaur family, or as many people know them around the world, the famous plant-eating, duck-billed dinosaurs. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> My head could be its brain. Yeah. Hadrosaurs are some of the most well-studied groups of dinosaurs. But it's our very perception that we know so much about these dinosaurs that left us in shock at what we found that they were eating. In 2017, the discovery of hadrosaur coprolites in Utah made the headlines. When the fossilized species were studied at this very university, it was realized that they contained the fragments of crustacean shells. These once thought purely herbivorous animals have now been revealed to be opportunistic omnivores, occasionally feasting upon smaller animals like crabs whenever and wherever convenient. It just goes to show that there is still a lot to learn 
even from the most famous of dinosaurs. And speaking of famous dinosaurs, in the very next Skull Case, we are reunited with the star of last episode, Diplodocus, Colorado's giant. Is it only a matter of time until we find more famous dinosaurs to have eaten meat? Only time will tell. A proper carnivorous savage lizard, Torvosaurus is a rare find. In fact, Colorado is actually the state of its original discovery. More fossilized trackways, this time from the very area at which we stand. These were all found around the Lions and Boulder area. I find it sometimes easy to forget that these fantastical animals once lived on the same land that's under my feet, and how much things have changed. For example, in the Cretaceous period, the fairly dry state of Colorado was actually under a couple hundred feet of water. A shallow inland sea, called the Western Interior Seaway, once settled over the central United States. It was home to some of the most iconic prehistoric marine animals. The Cenozoic era delivers us another iconic herbivore, in the form of what I believe to be a female Megacerops skull. We have a good understanding of sexual dimorphism in Megacerops, and the lack of large cheekbones and a smaller and less pronounced nasal horn lead me to believe that this skull represents a female individual. Herbivores are easily some of the most common and distinct types of animals, but it's actually quite rare to find a herbivore that doesn't cheat on its diet. pretty cool that eventually turned into things like elk. This prehistoric ancestor to modern day deer gives us the perfect example of a herbivore that we know eats meat. Some of you may be surprised to learn that a purely herbivorous diet does not easily provide the necessary ingredients that your body needs. Modern deer, for example, solve this issue by occasionally breaking their dietary restraints and will consume carrion, aka the flesh of dead animals. This provides them with important nutrients like calcium and protein, two essential ingredients that are lacking in a herbivorous diet. However, that doesn't mean that they only settle for animals that are already dead. This video on YouTube captures a deer that found a grounded and possibly wounded bird. It makes for an easy target. So by supposedly cheating their human proclaimed diet, these deer are able to more reliably ensure that they will stay healthy and fit, especially while growing or in preparation for breeding. If something as common and well understood as a modern day deer can surprise us by eating meat, then who was to say that something as fantastical and mysterious as a hadrosaur couldn't do the same? As time goes on, our thinking and curiosity of these ancient creatures must continue to change. It's in the very nature of paleontology to have to fill in the missing pieces, and the odds will never be in our favor. Fossilization is such a rare process in itself that finding perception-altering clues for most animals will be next to impossible. That's why we must challenge the way that we look at fossils we already have. For sometimes, these clues could literally be right under their noses. The three-horned face, Triceratops. For such an iconic and famous genus recognized around the globe, you might still think it's impossible for a mind-boggling revelation to occur to Triceratops. But if nothing else, the hadrosaurs and deer from earlier were only the tip of the iceberg. Now this is really exciting because this is actually a nearly fully mature Triceratops skull. And really, you don't get to see these very often. I have uh, Triceratops skulls inside of my uh, home museum, Denver Museum of Nature and Science but they're never this big. Um, this one is probably about seven, maybe eight feet long. Uh, this isn't even the biggest Triceratops skulls can get. We have uh, Triceratops skulls reaching 11 feet long and frills that are seven feet wide. They're absolutely enormous. And this one here uh, has a very well-defined uh, front nasal horn and two large and forward curving brow horns. These horns that curve forward are only seen in fully mature individuals of Triceratops, as we now have a very good understanding of Triceratops ontogeny. As they grew, Triceratops heads changed drastically, with their horns and frills taking the spotlight. With little nubs for horns and a tiny flat frill, juveniles then began growing out their features. 
Their horns sprouted vertically and started curving backwards, while their frills arched upwards and became reinforced. As they approached adulthood, their horns then bent forward, and continued to do so until they turned into the forward-horned and neck-shielded tanks that we all know and love. In likely under 20 years, a mere dog-sized baby would explode into a massive, nearly 30-foot natural bulldozer. Triceratops, actually out of all ceratopsians, was really well equipped for defending itself and for even fighting. Um, most ceratopsians, what you see inside their frills, which are some of the most iconic body parts of these animals, um, actually had really big holes inside the frill here. But that's not here on Triceratops. And it's very uh, strongly fused, it's very tough and thick. We have many different types of uh, Triceratops skulls with injuries to the actual frill itself. It's pretty obvious that this frill was well equipped to defending its neck and even stopping things such as other Triceratops horns. We actually have some Triceratops frills that seem to have fissure marks and puncture holes that seem to be from what could only be other Triceratops horns. So that means that these guys actually might have been rutting, which is something that has been put more into question recently as a lot of Ceratopsians frills and horns don't seem to be very well equipped for it. But Triceratops seems to break that rule and it possibly did actually rut. And it probably would have used its horns and its frill in combat against something like a Tyrannosaurus. And as intimidating as this is, unfortunately Tyrannosaurus was still pretty well equipped to deal with it, but Triceratops wasn't going down without a fight. Now one of my favorite features of Triceratops that has really uh, pushed it into my favorites list for dinosaurs uh, more, more recently is the actual mouth of this animal. For a long time there have been individuals such as Mark Witten that have put, the uh, put forth theories that have suggested that Triceratops is actually omnivorous. And not just partially omnivorous like the earlier mentioned hadrosaurs, I'm talking about fully omnivorous animals. And that's for two reasons. One, the teeth. And this, this is because the teeth here on uh, Triceratops are actually like shears. They move past each other, grinding against each other. They don't do any chewing. They don't seem to be very good for um, taking apart car uh, herbivorous material. Um, so this is something you would more see in a lot of uh, carnivorous animals or omnivorous things, just shearing back and forth and no chewing. And it doesn't seem like um, the more iconic leaf-shaped teeth and most herbivorous dinosaurs are present here. And that really suggests that they had some kind of diet that we didn't really fully dive into before or understand. Now when you go onto the beak, this is what's really interesting. Triceratops' beak is curved. And when you look at um, animals of modern day, such as sea turtles and modern day birds, or modern day dinosaurs, there are two different types of beaks. There are flat beaks and there are hooked beaks. Beaks with exotic curves and hooks in them which these hook beaks help to grab onto meat and pull it off of dead carcasses and stuff like that. So this is something you see in carnivorous animals, such as most sea turtles, they will eat fish and jellyfish. And that is something you see on most sea turtles, except for the green sea turtle, which the green sea turtle is a herbivorous sea turtle and will only eat algae. And that animal actually has a flat beak. And this is something you see in things that are eating th things such as seeds or algae or, or plants, like in birds. Many seed-eating and plant-eating birds have just flat beaks, but something like an eagle or an albatross have hooked beaks, and that's for eating meat. So when you look at Triceratops and many other Ceratopsians, the fact that it has a hooked beak, which is only seen in carnivorous animals of modern day, you have to kind of assume, why does it have a hooked beak if it's just eating herbivorous material? And that's what more recently has been put into question and has made us consider maybe Triceratops was actually a meat eater. Not fully, but it would have eaten some meat. We don't know if it would have hunted or if it was just a scavenger, but it definitely would have been eating some kind of meat of some sort. We don't have any dietary proof of this, like anything inside the stomach contents or any copper lights, but based on the skull and the anatomy here, it seems like it's pretty obvious. So I think Triceratops should be used as an example as being one of the most iconic and famous dinosaurs of all time. Something you would think that our imagination and viewpoint of wouldn't change very much. I think we should use this as a prime example of just how little we know about dinosaurs and how much our thinking of them can change. And we really should be starting to look at a lot more dinosaurs in more interesting and uh, curious ways, opening up more possibilities to the way that they live such as this, which we all had thought was one of the most iconic herbivorous dinosaurs ever, might have actually been sneaking through Tyrannosaurus nests and eating their babies, or even beating them to the chase to carcasses.
While small in size, CU Boulder's Museum of Natural History makes a big impact. Not only does it have a fantastic and unique collection, but it harbors possibly one of the most impressive skulls in all of prehistory. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience of being able to see such a large specimen of one of my new favorite prehistoric animals. I personally tend to be more interested in lesser known species of dinosaurs, but this world famous three horned face managed to tip that on its head by proving that no matter how much it seems we have learned about an animal, there's more to them than meets the eye. What the? <laughs> they, they, they put a, a, a pliosaur uh, as a mosasaur thing. That's that's completely different. That that looks like Lyopleurodon. You know what that is, right? Uh -huh. That's a pliosaur. This is a mosasaur. These are lizards. They, they're the long ones, like in Jurassic World. Uh -huh. They they didn't look like that at all. Mistakes.